Great. Uh, thank you, Brad, and thank you for all of the wonderful speakers today. It's been an absolutely fascinating afternoon. And thank you, of course, to the five for, for the Fight representatives and HCI for supporting my research and uh, the, the project I'm going to tell you about today. So my title is Melanoma Intercepted, Preventing Permissive Melanocytes from Initiating Melanoma. I recognize that is a mouthful of a title, but it's really a pretty simple concept that we're going to be talking about, and that's the concept of transformation which is the word we use to describe when a healthy, well-behaved, normal cell, in our case, a skin cell called a melanocyte, turns into a cancer, in our case, a skin cancer called melanoma. Now, we are particularly interested in what causes transformation, and I would hope most people in this audience would know that when it comes to skin cancer, and certainly melanoma, we've already got a pretty good beat on this, right? We know that UV exposure via either the sun or tanning beds is a major player here. What I'm going to argue today is that this is half the story at best. I'm going to show you data uh, we've produced recently um, that is putting together the other half of this equation. Now, to introduce the concept between, behind the other half of this equation, I'd like to use a metaphor that I hope everybody can relate with. I'm using this metaphor because it transcends about four generations at this point and goes from nerdy culture all the way to pop culture. And that is the transformation of the fictional Dr. Bruce Banner, played most recently by Mark Ruffalo, <laughs> into the CGI monstrosity of the Incredible Hulk. Now, it's important to note we know exactly what causes Mark to transform. We know that he was exposed also to radiation, just like our skin cells, and this caused a permanent change in Mark, just like our skin cells. We also know this isn't enough, right? If you know anything about Hulk mythology, you know the last thing you want to do is to make Bruce Banner angry. This is the stimulus that actually gives you the Incredible Hulk. And importantly, this is reversible, right? If the way to deal with the Hulk is to calm the Hulk down, and then we get to deal with charming Mark again, and that is much more preferable. So we think something very similar to this is happening with uh, skin cancer transformation. It's not angry per se, but it is a reversible stimulus uh, for cells that have already undergone uh, mutagenic changes and that this is something we think we can reverse to, to turn away from the cancer. And so if you wanna deal with the Hulk, what you can do is make sure Mark doesn't get angry and stays calm, and then you don't have to deal with that beast. Same idea here, if we reduce the angry stimulus, increase the calm stimulus, maybe you won't have to deal with the cancer. This concept is called cancer interception. Uh, the idea is that we could cure cancer by preventing it from happening in the first place. And this is very desirable, right? If we let cancer progress um, fully, it becomes very difficult to deal with. It's a moving target associated with high mortality, high morbidity, and tremendous cost in terms of not just finances, but also emotion and years of quality life. And the idea here is that if we can identify the stimulus and prevent the cancer from forming in the first place, we can avoid all of this. Now, of course, the problem, at least with melanoma, is that we don't really have a good bead on what these other stimuli are, and that's really what the focus of my Five for the Fight Fellowship is. And so to dig a little bit more into the science here, first, why would we suspect that these oncogenic mutations are really only half the story with melanoma? All right, this model of clonal evolution of cancer progression is quite well established, where um, you have increasing numbers of mutations, some of which induce some sort of uh, uh, selection allowing for clonal outgrowth, acquisition, more mutations, so on and so forth. So one of the reasons we began to suspect this was one of the first projects I was involved with in studying melanoma when I was at UCSF in collaboration with Hunter Shannon Boris Bastian was to directly test that clonal evolution hypothesis in the context of melanoma. We took different stages of melanoma progression, sequenced their genomes, and asked if there were a ordered um, number of mutations at each of these different progression stages, as one might expect. And the answer was yes for some progression stages, mostly in the advanced disease. But in the early stages of the disease, there was really a single mutation, BRF E600E, that drove a number of different progression stages without evidence of additional mutations driving more. This, this story got uh, even more intriguing when we more recently with the same group decided to compare the genome of melanomas to that of healthy human melanocytes. I'll point out that in a uh, great number of uh, cancer genome studies, they have what we call a clonal bias. That is to say, you're comparing the mutations you can, can, can detect in a clonal tumor compared to that of, of mixed normal. So in a clonal tumor, every genome that goes in there uh, will have largely the same mutations in mixed normal, each cell will harbor its own mutations. And by most technologies, therefore, those mutations are invisible. If they were had oncogenic mutations, you would not even detect them if they didn't drive clonal growth. And so uh, what we found, uh, again, with Boris and with Hunter, is that the, um, in, when we took single-cell genomic approaches, 
Uh, again, we, we found that melanoma has a very high mutation burden. This is already known. It's one of the highest mutation burdens of all human cancers. But so too were the individual healthy melanocytes. They actually had the same or even higher mutation burden. So again, calling into the question this direct relationship between mutation burden and tumor progression. And finally, we know that the precursors to melanoma, which I've already mentioned are largely driven by BRFE 600 e are quite dynamic. Um, Nevi, we know that they grow and they change. We know that if we remove them and, and leave a few cells behind, they can regrow. This is called recurrence. We know that they can erupt, meaning that in a short period of time, uh, a patient can develop a, a many tumor or many nevi that weren't there before or the nevi they have that grow, right? So this all would suggest that you've got different phenotypes associated with a single mutation. And that leads to our hypothesis then that we're testing, which is that it's actually the transcriptional state of these melanocytes, which determines whether or not any particular mutation is oncogenic. Uh, this brings forth this concept of permissive melanocytes, which would be melanocytes uh, purely hypothetic at this point in our skin that harbor BRAF V600E mutation, but otherwise are, are not acting in any bizarre way. They are happy, healthy, well-behaved melanocytes until there is some sort of secondary signal that causes them to misbehave. Uh, what I really like about this model is it really opens up where we can intervene or prevent melanoma from forming, right? Current prevention strategies largely uh, circle around blocking the mutagen, blocking UV. Uh, in this case, if there were the second signal, uh, we could really intervene anywhere along these early stages. Um, but first, we need to know what those mechanisms are. And for that, we wanted to try to take a bead from our, our sort of natural defenses, so to speak, against tumor genesis. We know that over 99.9% .9 of melanocytic lesions with BRAF E600E are these benign nevi. Very few actually transform into malignant melanoma. And so uh, we wanted to ask, what, what are the defenses that these cells mount? Because they, uh, the, there, there very obviously was once a cell that was hyperproliferating, uh, and now it has stopped. Uh, so we asked this question directly, again, using transcriptomics of the clinical specimens. And what I'm showing you here in the upper right corner, these are the genes that are most highly expressed in benign nevi and differentially expressed that is downregulated in melanoma. And you can see of the six I've labeled, these are, none of them are protein coding genes. So they are all non-coding regulatory microRNAs. Uh, this is our, our first cohort. This has been a very reproducible observation. We have six cohorts from five different universities now where we asked whether we could blindly diagnose a malignant, a uh, uh, melanocytic lesion as benign or malignant using just the expression of these microRNAs and we're able to do so with a high degree of specificity. Um, and so the, just point out here that not, these non-coding RNAs, and particularly this MIR-211, are the most significant transcriptional differences between the benign and malignant. And I will circle back to this, this microRNA in a few slides. But first, to talk about the other half of this equation, we, everything I've told you about it has to do with comparing benign tumors to malignant tumors. We also need to compare it to normal. And so this is a study we actually just completed. It was published last week in Nature Cell Biology, and it's an exceptional amount of work by a postdoc in the lab named Rachel Belot. And what Rachel did was to take healthy human skin and pull out the melanocytes and use single cell RNA sequencing to look at the transcriptomes through development and in different anatomic locations of the adult. And this is a UMAP. Each dot represents a melanocyte, and their distance apart represents similarities or differences in their transcriptome. Um, obviously, our melanocytes change during development. No surprise there. But what I draw your attention to here is even in the adult skin, we have a spectrum of different transcriptional states. And if we now classify melanocytes based upon where they're located in the spectrum, we get some very interesting and reproducible results. Namely, in anatomic locations like palm and sole, we mostly have this VML or blue type of melanocyte. In locations like leg and arm, we mostly have this red type or CML type of melanocyte. And the reason that's interesting is we know a lot about the genetic drivers of melanomas that arise in palms and soles versus legs and arms. And they're different, right? And so the, we have different driver mutations from uh, melanocytes or melanomas arising in the area with the blue melanocytes as we do in the areas with, the, with melanocytes uh, that are the red melanocytes. And so that would, again, be more data for specificity of the oncogenic mutation for the transcript, transcriptome of the actual melanocyte. So this is all observational from human samples. Um, we also wanted to see if we could find functional evidence for this. Uh, and so we worked on setting up an in vitro modeling system of these different um, melanocytic states. Uh, so all of these uh, experiments are using primary human melanocytes grown in two different medias. I actually realized too late these labels are switched. 
Um, the medias are defined medias. The only differences here uh, are TPA is the mitogen in one media, EDN1 is the ligand in the other media. The TPA medias, if we then look at the transcriptomes, they are enriched for these same programs we found in human skin associated with differentiated melanocytes. And the EDN1 uh, grown cells, their transcriptomes have these programs we found in human skin associated with more stem-like melanocytes. And so this system now allows us in a very controlled fashion to ask this question, what happens now if we introduce this, this BRAF V600D mutation to these cells that are otherwise exactly the same, but they're in these two different transcriptional states? And so we have a DOCS-inducible BRAF V600D construct. You can see the more DOCS we add, the more BRAF V600D is expressed. We introduce, introduce in two states and see a pretty striking resp uh, result. Uh, if the cells are in the TPA-containing media, the more BRAF we add, the, 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 the gene is acting like a tumor suppressor. This has been published before, and it's actually preventing these cells from growing. If the same cells are growing in the TPA-free media, these cells are now um, hyperproliferating, and the gene is acting like an oncogene. And this is fully reversible, right? We can start by treating the cells uh, in the TPA media, expressing BRAF, they all grow the rest, and then partway through the experiment, switching that media, and these previously arrested cells uh, now start spiking with their proliferation. And so that tells us that the same alteration is either oncogenic or tumor suppressive, depending on the transcriptional state of that cell. And so what are the, um, uh, the transcriptional states that are influenced by either BRAF E600E or the media conditions? These volcano plots are showing you the genes that are altered by the media. You can see there's a lot of genes both up and down regulated, whereas the genes altered by expression BRAF E600E are quite small in comparison. If we look at the actual nature of these genes, the genes you'd expect to be upregulated by BRAF E600D, they are. Uh, these are from previous publications, and we can see that they're enriched for. But pretty much everything else, from regulation, regulators of cell cycle, metabolism, cell adhesion, differentiation status, and so forth, seem to actually be more um, related to the environment. Uh, that includes one of the top 10 most differentially expressed genes is this MIR211, the same one we saw from our clinical specimens. Uh, we see will also bounce around, be turned on and turned off, and that's by the TPA, and it's not mediated by the oncogene. And so really this shows us that the biggest transcriptional difference between our nevi and our melanomas is not driven by the oncogene, but rather by this environmental stimulus. MicroRNA is also um, an important driver of this growth arrest and toggling this growth and um, arrest switch. So if we overexpress the microRNA, the cells uh, stop growing. If we overexpress an inhibitor of the microRNA, we can rescue the, the oncogene-induced growth arrest. And then uh, we, we wanted to get an idea of the, sort of the mechanism by, by which the microRNA was functioning, and we got a, a really good hint just by conducting live imaging. Look at the cell in the middle, you'll see something alarming, which is that the cell's dividing into three instead of two, and then two of those cells are immediately coming back together again. All right, so this is a cytokinesis catastrophe or failure, and indeed when we look at DNA content, we see evidence for increased um, amount of DNA in these growth arrested cells indicating polyploidy. This is exciting because it's exactly what we also see with our clinical specimens. Here is a nevus cross-section zooming in, and you can see plenty of these cells have more than one nuclei. Uh, it's easier for, for, for me, I'm not a pathologist, I, I like to pull cells apart and put them in a dish, and so this is a fresh nevus uh, where we've taken the melanocytes out, stand them to make sure we're looking at melanocytes, and see, again, that they're, they're polyploidy. Um, and I see I'm running low on time, so I will be very fast here. Basically, we hunted for mechanism by looking at genes that were, uh, could phenocopy this and that were downregulated by the microRNA and very quickly landed on this aurora kinase uh, B as a downstream node. Uh, the take home here is if we take a, a human piece of skin that has a nevus, take the nevus cells out. These are cells that have, have been stable for, for decades in the patient, and now express aurora kinase B, we can get them to start growing again. Um, and so the reason aurora kinase B is exciting is that there are FDA-approved small molecule inhibitors that are specific for aurora kinase B, and we are seeing that melanocytes that express BRAF E600E are, are selectively um, uh, inhibited in their growth by, by the small molecule as opposed to melanocytes that don't. And so our, our conclusions is that uh, uh, in our adult skin, we have at least two different sort of um, pol polars of, of, of types of melanocyte transcriptomes. Um, and depending on where these melanocytes are, the same mutation will either induce um, proliferation and, and presumably uh, tumor genesis or growth arrest. And importantly, 
these two states can toggle, and that toggling can happen either before or after introduction of the oncogene. And so our going work is um, we, we still need to determine whether we can actually detect permissive melanocytes in adult human skin, and we're developing the technologies to do so, and that's where our Five to the Fight funding is continuing to go. Um, Five for the Fight was also funding um, early in, in vivo work to determine whether we could reverse or prevent melanomagenesis using some of this knowledge that's recently been funded by the NCI um, in order to be able to continue that project. So just a huge thanks to Andrew McNeil and Rachel Belode who conducted most of this work, again to Five for the Fight and uh, Huntsman Cancer Institute. Thank you. Beautiful talk, Rob. I'm interested in the microRNA and what regulates it. So is it regulated by metabolism, for example, in like different nutrient conditions in the media? I didn't quite catch what was driving that difference. Yeah, well, that's because we, so basically we have these two different media conditions, right? Um, on paper, those two different molecules kind of do about the same thing, although one is a bit more potent, less natural version of the other. Uh, so we don't really know yet in skin what, what that stimulus would be. Uh, but we do know that this microRNA is downstream of UV, right? So it is also possible that a secondary way in which UV um, is sort of influencing these melanocytes is, it's, yes, it's causing mutations, but it's also causing the upregulation of this microRNA that, that prevent the cells from, from proliferating. Yep. Great talk, really. Uh, my question is related a little bit. Um, so what do you think is driving the microRNA? Is there a maybe a transcription factor that you can see in the data yes, but, that's then driving it and others to change the landscape? Sure, so, so the, what we know about that microRNA transcription, it's, it's uh, um, in, intronic, so it, it basically uh -huh. exists in an intron of another gene, mm -hmm. and that gene is regulated, a well-known downstream gene from uh, MIDEF, right, which is a master regulator of melanocyte differentiation. Mm -hmm and is also increased in expression upon UV exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's, we, we know that that is at least part of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's this issue with melanocyte biology where a lot of the same genes that we use to talk about melanocyte differentiation are the same genes that are involved in the pigmentation pathway, right? Which isn't just differentiation, because it also, you know, we have a UV-induced tannin response, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so there's often sort of a lot of, um, sort of convolution of what is a tannin response and pigmentation versus what is actually differentiation. Um, in this case, though, um, you know, for what that's worth, these, the cells that express this microRNA do appear to be more differentiated, and they do to be, based upon our single-cell sequencing study from human skin, they, they do seem to be more like the cells that are predominant in our skin, which would suggest that, again, with, with that model, there could be a number of cells that have the oncogenic mutation but aren't changing their behavior until the stimulus causes them to, to behave differently or to yeah. de-differentiate a little bit. I also wonder about the, the epigenetic landscape that might underlie the transcriptional landscape too. Thoughts Ab about absolutely. Yep. Yep. I mean, I, you know, if the transcriptome is changing, it is very likely that is due to the epigenome, right, and, and something that we'd love to look into. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, wait, so we do, sorry, we have one uh, question from the chat. Chat question, okay, <laughs> great. Um, it's from Bruce Edgar. Uh, what would be the in vivo correlate of TPA or UV? The in vivo. So the, the, um, that's, that's one of the interesting parts here, right? So the, the EDN1 that we have in the other media Theoretically, that's what the TPA is actually substituting for, but obviously that's not entirely true because we're seeing drastically different phenotypes between the two of them. So ED EDN1 is, is released in skin in response to UV. Um, TMA is um, you know, basically synthetic, right? So it's, it's sort of artifactual in the media. And so we are really interested in seeing what's sort of different, what the mechanistic differences are between those two molecules because in, in cartoon science, they're basically doing the exact same thing, but that's, that's obviously not the case here. Yep. yep, thanks.